So I, I have a few monikers that I'm going under. I have a company called Lumens that's uh, a little bit of the interaction design and installation based stuff. Grant Davis does uh, artistic work under that name as an installation artist. And then there's VJ Culture. So not DJ, VJ, right? So I'm doing things with a lot of video, going out on tour with bands, um, creating installation work and, and VJing for brands as well as the bands and, and DJs. And it all began back in 97. And in 97, I went out to Burning Man, and this kind of sounds cliche, but I experienced this immersive environment of projection and all this stuff, and I was so blown away that these people would bring out $30,000 of gear out to the desert, out to the dust, and do this show. And at the time, I was a bike racer. I was working for Rock Shocks that makes the suspension on mountain bikes and touring the country as a race technician. And I literally just dropped what I was doing, contacted this company called Dimension 7, I said, I want to work for you, I want to do this, and, and uh, under good faith, they, they brought me on. And uh, so four months later, I'm kind of interning with them, and they're mentoring me, and I wanted to do something that, there was this emerging community in San Francisco, a visual artist that was happening. This was right around 2000, and uh, I wanted to embrace that and, and bring it together into one place. And we had this great warehouse space south of Market, and this is what is on the screen right now. It's just a, a little sampling of that. And uh, we had all white walls. We would throw up projection on the screens. And we started inviting other visual artists in the area and people just involved in technology. And uh, we called it Video Salon. And Video Salon became this monthly gathering where people could showcase their work. They could talk about the technologies that are happening. And they would bring their laptops and all their video gear and just jam. And back at that time, it wasn't just about laptops. In, in 97, 98, I was bringing uh, four VHS tapes. I had a rack mount monitors that came out of a, a tank that was 70 pounds, and I had a huge stack of VHS tapes. So if I wanted to mix video, I was literally jockeying VHS tapes, going back and forth, and our whole goal was not to ever show a blue screen. You, know, you didn't want that, so it was really, literally jockeying VHS tapes. So obviously we know that things have changed since then. But here are just a couple of, of photos of our space. Um, and we would have a lot of different presenters. People from Apple would come and show, and all these different uh, technology partners would come through and showcase their work. Well, we decided to take it outside. Across the street from our building was a huge parking lot and a, a blank wall that was seven stories tall and literally one block wide. And we decided to have a video riot. And the first year we did video riot, we didn't tell the, the police or anybody about it, and they show up. This wall is literally like covered. These, sh these photos are a bit dark. I don't know if I can brighten this up a bit. Um, the walls were just covered with video. There's 20-some artists hitting it with, with slide projectors like, and film projectors, lasers, you name it. And basically what it was was a free-for-all. We provided the power. We helped create the infrastructure. People brought their own projectors, put them on their car, we had a DJ that was across the street in our warehouse, and I bought a little pirate transmitter radio, so we were broadcasting to all the car stereos. Everybody had it on the same station, and it was, it was really fun. And the police showed up, and they're like, what the hell do you guys think you're doing? And I'm like, well, there's no law against you know, projecting on a building, and we're not, you know, there's no sound uh, permit requirements because we're just going to car stereos. And you're kind of like, well, you've got to get a permit to gather. I'm like, okay, but he didn't shut us down. So uh, the next year, we got a permit. We got generator permits. That year, the police came, and they literally were tuned into the station with us. They were hanging out. We, gave it, we wrote their name in lasers up on the screen. They gave us props for it. And, and, this, and this video riot became a really bonding moment for so many visual artists of the time. Uh, I have a, a little a quick clip that I'm going to play that uh, Tech TV covered us. And uh, let's see if this is going to work for us. And now, here's Tech Live. Throw a bunch of video artists in a parking lot at night, give them some gadgets, and wait for the sky to light up. What do you get? One hell of a video riot. Part electric tailgate party. But we don't have a pass between it and... Part drive-in multiplex. Obesity this art exhibition bad. is outside, communal, and trippy. 
All right, that's, I, I didn't want to go into the interviews parts of it. But basically, it, it got us a lot of attention. And, and uh, this was really before we saw a lot of projection happening on buildings, a lot of the projection mapping that you may be hearing about and, and seeing today. So my roots came from this whole VJN community. And uh, I eventually moved to Los Angeles. It, it has stopped for a while, but I literally just got an email last night about a guy who's starting something very similar back up. And he's asking for all the old contacts, so I just emailed him a list of, of people who he should reach out to and, and, uh, and you know, talk to and get things going again. So from that experience, I've, I've continued to be a, a visual artist as a VJ, but I'm also getting contacted a lot to do interaction design. And interaction design, if you're not really quite familiar with it, it's very similar to interactive design. But in the beginning years, you know, like early 2000s, we were uh, interactive designers, but then the web people hijacked that term. They call web interactive. I still want to call it uh, something else, but now we use the term interaction. And interaction is literally some kind of involvement with the installations or uh, engagement with the artists, the installations, and uh, the, the guests. So uh, I've been doing a lot of work with Facebook. They're a big client for me, and in 2011, 2010, actually, they reached out to me to build a huge uh, wall. It's 80 feet by 20 feet full of projection, kind of like a war room wall. And uh, that war room wall, they wanted to have all sorts of different things happening in it. Like in this uh, particular shot of it, we were taking all the data from people's likes on Facebook and, and uh, bringing that into uh, a geographic thing. So we have all the people at, that were at the F8 conference and they had things like who, you know, how many attendees, what was their most viewed video between those attendees, and then in San Francisco, what was the most viewed video, and then globally, what was the most viewed video. And so we had different things like that for music, for video, for all sorts of different, different types of things. And this was just a data visualization that was all running in real time. Um, we had, uh, up the, where it says F8, we had a sound reactive, um, pulsing logo that was built in processing. Uh, there's this kind of Brady Bunch photo booth experience, and I'm going to cover that a little bit more. I'll come back to that. But basically, there were five or six different photo booths throughout the, the building. People could badge in with these RFID or NFC chips, and it would ma immediately tag them to their uh, Facebook profiles. And uh, then we could also display it and bring it up in here. And then we had all sorts of other types of visualizations happening, maps showing people. Um, there's in this very bottom, it's quite dark, but down here in the center now, there was a friend request showing all the different friend requests that were coming in globally around the world. And this thing's just firing off like a storm on the sun. It was really impressive. And then this section up here that has kind of these flight paths, what we did with that is we basically, we took um, uh, some... Let's bring this over here. I'm not using PowerPoint. I'm using my own VJ software to make this all happen, or Keynote or anything like that. So we use these uh, NFC chips. That's those little uh, bracelet pieces with the, the F logo on it. And those are the readers. And they're just USB readers. We have Mac minis underneath there. And they're placed throughout all the different breakout sessions around uh, the conference. So people could literally just swipe their wristband, walk in, and uh, we could create a flight path showing these people migrating from maybe a, mar a presentation on marketing, then they're going to the general session, and we had all these paths, and we could, we could uh, visualize that path on a, on a data of time and when they were doing it, and you know, just showing what the most popular presentations were. So we were doing that with these NFC chips and uh, bracelets, and uh, all that data was coming into kind of this command center that we had, and we had literally eight to 12 laptops set up, and we're running all these different things, and they're all coming out and being routed into the projectors. So that was one of the, the big installations that we did. We also worked with a, a friend of mine named uh, Moldover, and he has a, it's basically, it's like a, a digital drum circle. There, each one of these keyboards is hooked up to one laptop underneath, and each speaker is its own sound, so everybody can jam in on, on the music, and they could start playing their own you know, tracks and playing with whether it be drum sounds or synth sounds or whatever. And it sounds like it wouldn't work, 
but when you run it through some of these music programs like Ableton, it just kind of brings all the timing together, it quantizes it, and it, and it works. And so we had a lot of different installations like that going around. Um, we did all the branding for them as well for their after parties and created a lot of different looks. So Facebook has been a, a pretty important client for me. They've, they've done a lot of uh, really unique things, and they're pushing the boundaries, and I've been very, very privileged to have access to their engineers, to work with them directly on some of these projects. So what I want to show you uh, next is this thing that we did. It was called, well, we're going to show you a quick clip of the uh, photo booth that I was talking about. So I'm going to exit out of my full screen. That TP, as I was mentioning before, the whole blue screen concept of never wanting to go to a blue screen when I was uh, VJing, I've embraced that, and now I'm doing a whole series where I'm projecting nothing but blue on different surfaces, teepees, cliffs, abandoned buildings out in the desert, uh, all sorts of stuff. So it's a, a whole blue series that I've been working on. So let's see if I can, we're queued up to the right place. That we saw earlier today with one of our engineers. I'm terrible also at documenting see the music my work. Experience. I let other people do it. So this is Scott Hi. from Scotland. Now we're back at the photo experience, which you saw earlier, and we're joined by Scott, one of our engineers. We have a special treat because Scott's going to take us inside the photo experience and show us how it actually works. So Scott, why don't you walk us through how it all works? Okay. So we started off the day by getting our RFID tokens, which are actually embedded inside of our badges. <laughs> they look slightly like on the back of my badge. You can see the, uh, the aerial around the outside, and this is the essence, the RFID tag that's powering it. Uh, we're describing it as taking a Facebook app into the real world. So it's like experiencing it in more than just games and other apps that you see online. It's like here with us today. So after we've registered our tags and associated it with our account, we can walk up to one of the booths and touch it over this reader. And I will show you the insides now. Still. <laughs> wow. So yeah, this is the inside of the photo booth. It's actually just commodity hardware that you could pick up at any store. So we've got a Mac Mini here, a small fan, uh, SLR, which is for tethered shooting mode, and then the screen and the RFID reader. It's nothing too fancy. It, so yeah, when we walk up and we touch the token, it connects to the Facebook site and works out from the token who you are. And then from then, after it takes the photo, it knows that it can tag Scott because it was Scott's tag that's in front of it and that's the essence of how it works. It's quite simple. That's fantastic. It's simple to you, but I don't think it's simple <laughs> to the rest of us. So it's very impressive. Thanks for that demo to show us the behind the I'm going to jump in a video because what this all kind of ties into towards uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But at the same conference, this was um, at FMC. This happened at the Natural History Museum in New York, the same one that was you know, the night at the museum. And uh, that whole night of the museum, we really thought we were going to be able to experience that. We were asked to create a timeline experience that was basically, they wanted someone to use the same NFC RFID tokens, badge in, and then have their timeline displayed uh, across eight screens. So technically doing it across the eight screens was a huge challenge. It was a, a huge challenge to even build something at that resolution, because the pixels for building something at 8,000 resolutions wide. It, it's just like, there's not very many uh, graphics cards that can handle it, computers that can handle this. This was all written in uh, Open Framework, excuse me, in uh, OpenGL and C+, so it's not video at all. It's rendering everything in real time. And uh, we were working till about 11 o'clock at night, and then we were told, okay, you guys have to leave. And we're like, we've got 12 hours of programming still to do on this thing. So we had to leave. We take it back to our hotel rooms and, and build the installation there. The conference is starting, and we're still setting this thing up. And uh, people are coming by wondering when it's going to be ready. And once the, it, it was ready, we had a line down the museum floor waiting to experience this thing. When it comes to people being able to experience themselves and see something in an art installation, it's incredibly powerful. You put some you know, music behind it and put it on eight screens, and it really does move people. And the people at this conference, they were, you know, they're 
the elite of the, of the marketing industry. They've all come to see this new platform that uh, Facebook has un unveiled. So if I can find my mouse. And, and basically, this is one of the engineers who was uh, heading this project. And I was project managing this and working on the code with another programmer. So I'm here joined with Niket, who's one of our engineers who created this amazing social experience. So I'm going to turn it over to Niket, who's going to walk us through Timeline Hallway. Absolutely, thanks. So what we're doing here is I'm going to tag in with my RFID token. And what it's doing right now is it's pulling all of my data, all the content that I've had for the past four years in Facebook. And there's me. I'm going to be walking right through my whole life on Facebook. It's my profile picture, and we're going to take a walk, walking down the timeline. And this really focuses on the power of Facebook and what we have, all the content, all your memories, all your status updates. My first ones might not be that great. There's an early status update. I went to Texas. These, these get a little more interesting as we go along, I would hope. These are the, mo the top words that I have in all my status updates, all the things I say. I work at Facebook, so Facebook is one of the big clouds. Um, that's my first like on Facebook back in 2008 when he was campaigning. A couple, bunch of other brands. The power of Timeline and the power of Facebook is all the brands and all the pages that you like. Really have an intimate uh, relation with them. There's my first friend back from college. Most recent friend from a party last weekend. And these are all my friends right in between. Um, we really know who you are. We know who, you, who cares about you and who you care about. That's kind of scary. Here are some memories. Everyone's been walking through this. This has been one of the greatest scenes, is all the photos, all the really top memories. Walking all the way through the past four or five years, however long you've had your Facebook profile. And there's my cover photo from F8 last year, profile photo. And this is the money shot. This is everyone coming together, all of your friends, all the people you know, all the people you care about, right here, right at Facebook. That, that shot was really difficult and to you can tag bring in, in well across right eight screens. And share it back to your profile. And then you can share that. So you, it'll render it to a video for you. And, and there it is. And you can, you can share that. So thanks I'm, so much, Niket. That was amazing. And yeah, I feel thanks, like I Niket. know you so much better now. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, time is running short. So I am going to go back into my VJ software and quickly cover a few other topics. Um, I was invited to do a residency in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And so this was just purely not branded. Um, well, it kind of was, actually, so I can't say that. It, it was uh, an involvement that I was invited to be out there, and it was through Red Bull. And they wanted me to spend a month doing an artist residency. It wasn't specific about doing anything for them. It was kind of a thank you. And they invited uh, 10 artists from different countries. So I was uh, selected from the United States. And what I decided to, to do was we had this abandoned uh, hotel room. That was where we did our residencies. So I decided to use that room and create an installation. Um, and this particular one's called the gaze, or the gentleman's gaze. And it's a bed projection. I have a projector up in the ceiling. And uh, I'm projecting this uh, lawn, br Brazilian lingerie model that we found. And um, I, I used before the Connect cameras came out. This was a PSI and we hacked that and put bypass filters in it and made it so that it could do all of the detections that we needed to do. We filmed her on a green screen laying, laying on this bed and uh, then we used MaxMSP, an application, and, and it's called blob detection. So basically you've probably experienced these things in airports where you walk through and it starts creating bubbles or it moves things around and basically the way that works is a camera uh, is speaking to the application and it creates a grid and when something that creates a difference on any of those grid sections happens, it can create a reaction. It can make bubbles split. It can make you play soccer or allow you to play soccer with virtual balls being projected on the ground. So that was the technology that we, we used to, to do this. And um, in addition to that, I had, um, I, I filmed myself peering through a window and projection mapped this into one of the windows in the hotel so it looked, so you could see the person uh, like it's one person peering in, he's looking at this woman on a bed. And it's called the gentleman's gaze. And here's uh, a little bit of documentation on that. It's very dry documentation. So forgive me. The, uh, feel much we won't go through all of it, but we'll just show Red you Bull some highlights. I participate in an artist residency known as the Red Bull House of Art in Sao Paulo, Brazil 
during the month of November 2009. The gentleman's gaze was a fulfillment of the month-long residency. It is a dual projection installation exposing one of our most vulnerable human moments, sleeping. The audience joins in the voyeuristic activities as they observe a woman lying on the bed. All the while, a gentleman gazes through the bedroom window via projection. Similarly, the gentleman's gaze implies a chauvinistic perception of the power structure between men and women through the gaze. Gentlemen in the window suggest a sense of self-entitlement to stare at women. Curiosity draws the viewer into the room to take part in the gazing without the woman's knowledge. The installation was built using blob detection via Jitter Max MSP. Camera mounted above the bed along with the All right, so I kind of covered that part. But basically what would happen is if someone could touch her feet, she would curl her feet up. They put her hand over her head, she would, you know, kind of act like she's sleeping and, and part of it. But if somebody laid down next to her, which is very tempting for anybody to want to engage with this, this woman on the bed, she gets up and walks away. So it's kind of like this little <laughs> moment where it fools them in what's really, what's really happening. So I, I, I didn't want it to go any further than, than that. So that was, that was my, my, my cue for that. Um, one of the other things that I've been working a lot with is Instagram. And Instagram, as far as working with brands, has been really powerful. And, and I'd like to experiment with this tomorrow night, maybe even today. We've got the hashtag Hatchfest. And basically, what I can do is I can pull in all the photos that are coming in from Instagram. So if you have it, and you're taking photos around here, hashtag at Instagram. And then that's going to come up into my laptop, and I can bring in the photos and put them on the screen and transition through it. We, c we can build it into all sorts of different uh, displays. And we've even uh, built an Instagram printer. So all you need to do is go, you know, hashtag whatever the, the hashtag is. It comes up on the screen. This, is, this one's done for uh, Mini Cooper. And uh, you can immediately print out your photos on a little uh, Polaroid. So it's a really fun little system to play with. Um, and the importance of, of engaging somebody with photo booths, with Instagram, and all these things, we were having this discussion last night. Really, what it comes down to with a lot of interaction these days is people want to see themselves. They want to be able to broadcast it to their networks and show that, the peop that they were there. You go to a concert, half the time people have got their phone out like this. They're not engaging with each other. They're engaging you know, to, with their phone to tell their friends, this is where I am, this is what I did. So Instagram is kind of a perfect solution for that. They've just hit a million, 100 million users, and most of them are, are teenagers. But something that I thought was really... Uh, powerful. Um, this is uh, Instagram has an API. It means that you can you can go into their system and build your own web application. And this particular one allows you to go by region. So if you took the parameters of Los Angeles, and uh, people were, you know, doing photos, any photo coming in from the Los Angeles area could be put into this system. So normally uh, in Los Angeles, you're going to see photos of whatever. A couple weeks ago, Endeavor, as it was doing its final flight, uh, it wasn't flying, it was riding piggyback on a 747, but it was, it was going into uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and it was flying over all these different cities, San Francisco, Austin. So I decided to capture, this is just a screen capture, of what was happening in Los Angeles at exactly 12 o'clock. And so what you can see is almost all these photos are of, of Endeavor. They've, everybody was filming it. I mean, it was, it was incredibly powerful, and it's one of the few moments where everybody comes together and is doing something and socially sharing it. So I, I think that Instagram is an incredibly powerful thing, and there's just so many different things that we can use it for in building interaction design. Uh, a number of years ago, who was the person of the year that was Time's chosen person? It was you. And they chose it because of social media and all of our contributions and what we're doing uh, individually. So we are now the media makers, whether we consider ourselves that or not. That content is being crowdsourced, aggregated, and how it gets displayed is where people like interaction designers come in. How it's being used as a, uh, some kind of infographic. It really can be a powerful message just like the endeavor and, and how it was bringing people together. I'm starting to run over my time, but I, there was just one video that I wanted to share with you. In this video, um, this was called uh, a Merkaba setup that I did at a, a yoga festival in Tahoe. 
And so it's projection mapping. Projection mapping is where you're, you're uh, specifically isolating your video and mapping it onto specific items. You've probably seen videos of it on YouTube where they're doing it on buildings and facades. I built this uh, just out of tubing, PVC tubing, used highly reflective tape, and uh, projection map very thin strips to run along the side of this. At the festival, people could walk up. There's an iPad. They could control the visuals themselves and play with it and change it. And then there's that uh, acrylic sphere that's hanging in the center. And that sphere also has mapping on it, but people could put their head inside of it. There you go. <laughs> and it was just like this really interesting thing because there's a little camera mounted, right? It's a little bit smaller than these spheres up here. Camera mounted on the inside. And then it, the camera feed comes into my laptop. I reproject it and position it exactly onto the, onto the sphere like that. And the, the people just absolutely loved it. They lined up. Once they did, I didn't explain that you need to put your head in there that often to people. They just started to figure it out for themselves. And their discovery of that was really fun. And again, it was a line of people to experience this thing. And everybody was having a great time playing with it. There's this woman at the very end. Um, let's, let's go back. You can't hear her very well. You can see how there's a line of people kind of waiting to get into this thing. And we've done it where we've also set up a photo experience where people can take pictures of themselves. Back up as far as you can. With your head. Good. Now you look like an astronaut. <laughs> oh my god. Your kids are gonna think you're a dragon. <laughs> They're gonna think we went to a rave. <laughs> Chris, you got to stop it. I don't know if they were high or not, but she's saying, your kids are going to think you're on drugs. And she's, you know, she's filming this for her, for her friends. So it, it's moments like that that really bring the whole interaction design back for me, that give me the, the pleasure of, of creating these things, because they're often hours and hours worth of work. Uh, so it's those moments, that real-time interaction that I get that, to meet with people and, and see their feedback immediately. It's not always apparent when you do things and with film where you release it out into the ether or whatever your distribution channels, and you're not really quite sure how that's worked out until you start seeing your feedback through critics or whatever. But in interaction design, you're experiencing it real time, and you get to have that opportunity to, to share and, and share your technology and ideas with people as it's happening. So I feel incredibly privileged to be able to, to work in this field. I've had so many doors open to me, and... I, like I said, I'm incredibly uh, fortunate to be doing what I'm doing and very happy to be here. So thank you very much. <laughs> so questions? Wow. Okay. Uh, there's got to be questions. <laughs> Stuff's amazing. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is a, a close friend that's moved here to Bozeman. I haven't seen him in 10 years, and we lived in the Bay Area together. And uh, it's so funny he brings that up because we built these Roman chariots, like full-size Roman chariots that were hand-pulled, um, donned the costumes. We last minute found a, a Caesar to ride with us on this chariot, and we dragged him through the streets of San Francisco. And Halloween in the Castro District in San Francisco is like 200,000, quarter million people. And we brought these chariots in there. And we put tiki torches. It's not very Roman themed. But we brought tiki torches and put them on the ends of these chariots and had these cans of ether starting fluid that we would like shoot into the air and it'd create a 12-foot flame of fire that beaming across all these people's heads. They'd see it way down the street and, and want to see what was going on. So that was one of our, our uh, activities together. And then the year following that, we did a human car wash. So we had about 12 people. Uh, they would line up. We had like these like little rain things. And we would walk through these large crowds of people. And there were some people that were dressed up with long brushes on them. And they would rotate 
like a car wash, and there was all these different activities that happen as you drive through a car wash. And there was somebody with a fake fur on umbrellas to buff people, and they would be naked people. There would be all sorts of people coming through this thing. Halloween is one of the few days in San Francisco you can be naked in the street. Uh, and then at the very end, we brought back those cans of ether as the blow dry. So as people were exiting this experience of, of six people on each side lined up, there would be these cans of ether, and we'd shoot them in the air, and you'd feel all this heat coming across your body. So that's, I think, what Jeff was talking about. <laughs> yeah. So the, the whole idea of where we're going with um, some of the things I was showing that Facebook has with the NFC, which is, stands for Near Field Communication, a lot of phones now... Uh, most of the Android phones have this embedded technology in it. And what it's designed for is for payment systems. You go to a cafe, you can use your phone, and you tap it against another device that has near field, kind of like the bump application on the iPhone. And you can do your whole payment system. Well, we're taking that technology and taking just the chip, just that, the chip out of it, and we're embed embedding it in bracelets. And those bracelets then, you go to a festival like Bonnaroo, Coachella, Lollapalooza, and you can now interact with art installations through um, your bracelet. That means that we can create all these installation things that we're doing for some festivals coming up this spring. And you register your bracelet, you get it in the mail, you register it with Foursquare, Twitter, Facebook, Google, doesn't matter what it is. And it's now authenticating your presence and you just like swipe it right through. And it then says, okay, this is Grant, do you want to post to, to Twitter? Yes, you use your mobile device if you want. Uh, do you want to check in on Foursquare? Yes. And this way we can start creating games. We can start creating um, a system where if people want to play games, you go to main stage, you're going to get one point, and you start collecting points. You go to the discovery stage where it's just like the up-and-coming artist, you get 10 points. You get on the Ferris wheel, you get three points, and eventually you get enough points, you get to be in VIP section. You get to win the whole competition, you get the most amount of points, you get a free helicopter ride, from the venue to wherever. You know, so it's those types of gaming uh, scenarios. And what NFC, the Near Field Communications, or RFID, uh, Radio Frequency ID, I believe, what it does is it's just making interaction easier. Uh, I've worked with QR codes. I've worked with all sorts of different things, but making the experience easier for people, that's all part of design, right? Making it a better experience. When you uh, make things much easier, you're gonna get, going to get a better engagement. And so that's where our, our, our next uh, venture is, is going more into these devices, using them more for fun and play and art installations instead of for um, tracking people and figuring things out like that. And so that's our, uh, that's our next venture, where we believe we're taking it. All right, I've probably gone over time. And let's yeah, have a question? Oh. Uh, v Squared Lab did that, and they're, they're good friends of mine. And we collaborate on different projects, but I did not collaborate on that. That's something that John designed, the, the cubes, and he just presented it and said, do you want to do something with that? And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But uh, the Amon Tobin show that he's referencing is an incredible uh, projection mapping environment that if you just Google it, it'll blow you away. Yes, John. Can you tell us anything here that you can't tell anyone else that's top secret? I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Okay, as a friend DA. Uh, cut the camera, no. <laughs> yeah. Of all the agencies in the ad world that you've worked with, who's your favorite? Have the ad agencies to work with? The funny thing is, is I work directly with, with Nike, Red Bull, Facebook. Uh, I go directly to them. I bypass the agencies. Uh, I just did a big uh, tour with Samsung and Google, and that was through Good B Silverstein. Yeah, if I can if I can bypass the agencies, I'm more than happy to do that. But that's not always the case, obviously. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna flip into another mode and help whoever else. Yeah. So thank you. Mm -hmm.